episode of the Metapod Podcast, the Pokemon podcast that revolves around the evolving meta, correctly predicting what was probably the best play for NAI. Debatable. I guess that's a debatable thing. We can talk a little bit more about that later. But the topic of discussion today here on the Metapod is the North American International Championships. And one of us on the podcast was able to go to the championships. So my lovely co-host over here, Sean, how was it? It was good. It was a uh, very, it was very packed and busy, especially on Friday, which was the day that I played. That's day one, so that was a very busy day. Um, mm-hmm. And I want to say there was twenty six hundred. I'm looking at one of the screen twenty six hundred and seventy seven Masters players. Which they, what you need to know is they labeled it as the biggest yeah. event. You it, know. And I, I'm going to say it felt like it because when you would get your pairings and you'd be like, what table do I need to go to? And you'd just be like, okay. And it's just a flood of people all trying to f- go to their tables on various ends of this gigantic hall. But um, I, I, I do think that it's, there will come a point where either we will just hit a hard cap on tournaments we just have to, or they will have to break tournaments out day one into two pods. Mm-hmm. Like, lo- like logistically, you will have to do that at some point because they, um, I know other card games have done that. For like in North American internationals, didn't they? Or like a regional, mm-hmm. didn't they have pods? I know at that, one point. I don't know. Other card games have done that. So, I'm pretty sure Pokemon, mm, at least since I've been playing at one time, did it. a pod type style. Or maybe that was Limitless when COVID hit. Limitless and did they were it. Doing yes. a Limitless online series. I do remember they did that because they tried the first day on the website <laughs> and then the website like couldn't handle it. And then they're like, I think we'll do yeah. it in two pods. But, but no, yeah. I do agree from that with what I heard. And I heard the tables too. Come <laughs> on, fit yes. Two play yes. mats. Yes, I am so glad that this information got out. Okay, one thing to the Pokemon company, if anybody out there is listening, or or day two events, because they were the ones who Just actually- organizers. Yeah, well, technically, they, they were the organizers of this. I think this is one of the first times, I could be wrong, but it's uncommon for- a tournament organizer that isn't directly the Pokemon company to organize this event. This was organized by day two. I'm sure they just rented tables, but I think they need to make sure that they're giving the table rental company specific sizes because yeah, you couldn't fit two play mats like horizontally next to each other. It was too skinny. <laughs> so you, you could not fit two Metapod podcasts, official play mats. No, Without them hanging off on the uh, tables. I am so glad you mentioned that because that was the first thing that I noticed. And so many other people were like, what is going on here? This is a this is an official TCG tournament. Everyone knows what's going to happen. And the table's too skinny. Well, like, I, because I, I remember seeing some pictures and I was like, wow, this guy's mat's hanging off the table. And I was like, <laughs> but the, all the space is being used. And I was like, does this guy just have like a gigantic mat sitting no. in front of him? And I was like, no, it's a, it's a regular mat. It's just how it is. Yep. Well, I'm glad you and the viewers at home and everybody now know and picked up on that. Yeah. Um, but anyways, outside of that, though, it was a good event. Um, New Orleans was very hot. But from what I hear, people really dug the city and having, you know, this international in New Orleans. Uh, spoiler alert, but it will be in New Orleans again next year. That was announced. Um, and outside of that, we did. I did get to meet, uh, you know, a number of people that, you know, shouted out, said hi as they walked by. Some people came to the meetup. Um that was really, really awesome. So I just want to say, like, not not dropping any specific names, but, like, shout out to y'all. If you said hi to me, if you came out to the meetup, uh, I hope you enjoyed the base to fossil format <laughs> decks that yeah, I brought. Yeah, I saw you running that. Yeah. And then um, also, I just want to quickly shout out Appa for mm-hmm. uh, who he actually, they, they, they caught me in the middle of the street. I was, like, walking by and, and shouted out. And it was like, oh, Metapod, Sean. And I was like, yeah. I was like, I'm Appa. And I'm like, yo, Appa making day two. Shout out mm-hmm. to you. That's 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 the person that I'm going to shout out because uh, that was that was impressive. So that's someone that I've known uh, through like content and stuff in a long time. And they're also a longtime listener of the Metapod podcast. So 
big shout out to Appa on their accomplishments this weekend. I know they played a fun list um, from what I saw on Twitter after the event, but there are a ton of fun lists that you can start playing from now until the next North American International Championships. We don't have dates for the International Championships yet, so you'll just have to focus on what was going on now. So talking a little bit about the MetaShare for day one. Let's just talk about that right away just to show you the idea of that day one, how many people were playing, what decks. Lugia, the most popular decks. We talked about on the Metapod podcast how Lugia was getting a boost and was probably going to be really popular, and it showed in here the most amount of players. Raging Bolt Ogre Pond. This one kind of sort of surprised me that it was second place overall at about 15% of the meta because... I know a lot of people are hyping on it on Twitter, but I I almost thought it was like Trojan horse kind of thing. Mm-hmm. Like people have done this with decks before where they just insanely overhype it for this yeah. big event, you know, first first uh, first tournament of this format, you know. Um, and then coming up behind it, not not too far behind it, is Gardevoir, our pick for yeah. the tournament. And then rounds out at 9% with Lost Box, uh, 5.5% with Dragapult, and then five and a half percent with Maridon as the top six decks. I think Charizard was the seventh deck. I think they showed the next couple. Charizard is right behind Maridon, just like two or three players off. Yeah, and I it's interesting. I think that if you had played Charizard, like we don't know. We'll actually see the day two breakdown in just a second here. But I do think Charizard probably would have been not terrible. Um because like we say, like, yeah, it might you might look at Raging Bolt. I think Raging Bolt has a good matchup against Charizard, most likely. Yeah. <laughs> um, you know, depending on who gets to go first, second, whatever. But, you know, you might only hit one of those in your uh in your day one, so that's fine. But against most everything else, right? Like against Gardevoir, you're probably feeling pretty good against Lost Zone Box. Like, you know, barring you know, some pretty problematic cards like uh, uh, Iron Thorns EX that you might play in a Lost Box stack. You're probably feeling pretty good. So, yeah, surprised that it was a little further down, but I, I do think that maybe people were just worried about seeing a lot of Dragapult too. That Devolution TM just sort of being like, I'd rather not risk it. So, but I, I will say, a- in terms of Lugia, I did personally play too. So... And you played, you played, was it four rounds throughout uh, the, five. throughout five, you played five in total. Yep. So it was interesting to see the evolution as well for some of the archetypes. You know, you talk about Lost Box, right? Lost Box, we'll talk about some of the lists in a bit, but they really have changed coming into this new format to go back to the old kind of style turbo versions in a sense. So that's something like, in my opinion, and we'll talk again about some of the cards that were included in there, but some of those cards really surprised me overall. So, yep. Yeah. So, but that's day one analysis. Uh, and then moving on to day two, you think, okay, well, what, what did well, like what was the the right choice? Cause Mm -hmm. saying what everybody chose is one thing and then saying, okay, well, what was the right decision? Flipping over now to day two, Jake. You don't have this, but I do, so I can. Give I was you... gonna text you yeah. in the in the chat, like I don't, yeah. I can't see it, so you talk about I, it. <laughs> I couldn't figure out how to drop the screen. We, you know, anyways. Oh, but, good. <laughs> so Gardevoir jumps from what was it in day one percentage wise? Fourteen. Third. Yeah. Third so it, at fourteen percent. It jumps up to twenty one percent of day two is Gardevoir. So clearly, mm-hmm. Gardevoir is a big winner in in that respect. Lugia stays around, hovering at around 16%. So I'd say it's about, you know, a wash, right? Like if mm-hmm. you picked Lugia and you're really good at it, you hit the right matchups, you know, it's a fine deck. Mm-hmm. And then third place, you had Lost Zone Box. So Lost Zone Box up at 15%. So jumping from 8 to 15, almost doubling there. Um, and then rounding it out, you have uh, the Raging Bolts, uh, deck at 12%, so a slight drop off there. You have Maridon at 6%, so, you know, doing pretty well. And then finally, Dragapult at 4 So, uh, for me, what you clearly see there is the decks that stand out, and what top 8 will <laughs> will prove out is the yeah. decks that really stood out were Gardevoir and Lost Box. Mm-hmm. So, uh, whereas the others, like, I think that we were probably spot on saying that Dragapult was a very hyped deck, 
but nobody had really solved the list. Mm -hmm. And this conversion rate plus what we know about top eight, I just think sort of confirms that, Mm -hmm. you know, where it's just kind of like people will play it. It's not a bad deck. You can make a day two with it, but it's like it's still not ready. It's still not there for some reason. I think overall, Sean, if you want to show like the top eight real quick, so then this makes a little bit more sense. I think probably the only thing that we were or one of the main things, I'm sure we were wrong about a couple things, oh, yeah. but I think the main thing that we were wrong about is Lugia, once again. You know, we come into formats and we're like, ah, yes, Lugia has this one piece and now it's great. And then it's like, okay, it's better, but it's it's still like missing something. It still can't compete. But we were spot on with Gardevoir. Really, really liked Gardevoir for this event. It was both Sean and I's pick to win. Unfortunately, if we want to take so a look at Andrew Hedrick's uh, first place list here yeah. shortly, it uh, it did not win. <laughs> yep the uh, the winning deck here was uh, Andrew Hedrick running a Turbo Lost Box build. Um, mm-hmm. But you know the question then is okay, well it's Lost Box. We know what Lost Box is. What's new? What's new? What's new, Jake? There are a couple new things in the Lost Box deck. First, I want to say that it goes back into, like I mentioned earlier, the heavy inclusion of Turbo. You know, you see four of Pokestops. You see three Lost Vacuums, right? Yep. Lost Vacuums are a huge part in what kind of differentiates the Turbo list from like a more regular list, I guess you could say, in Lost Box decks. Mainly just chorus experiment and nothing else in terms of a supporter, just a boss and a Roxanne. The boss is pretty much like your counter catcher and your Roxanne is late game draw more cards, basically, yep. and try to stall out your opponent. One of the big additions in here that really surprised me, there's two from Twilight Masquerade, is the Iron Thorns EX, this uh, new future type Tyranitar lightning Pokemon, has a really, really cool ability that made a lot of of uh that made a lot of noise in the game i'm trying to pull it up because i'm the ability the the name uh the ability is i think initialization yes initialization i was like i know it's a word with a lot of eyes in it so (laughs) basically what that is if you do not know 230 hp lightning type future basic pokemon i feel like i said a lot of things right there With the ability initialization, as long as this Pokemon is in the active spot, Pokemon with a rule box in play have no abilities except for future Pokemon. So if you think back to the top decks in the uh, the format right now, you know, you think of Lugia, right? Has an ability. Ogre Pond, Raging Bolt. Ogre Pond's got a really good ability. Gardevoir. Gardevoir's got a really good ability. Charizard. Charizard has a really good ability. Maridon, right? The Maridon has a really good ability. So really, really interesting counter to put in. You might not think like it's not really a Pokemon that attacks at all. It's really just to like stop your opponent from doing the game plan. Um, and it's really, really cool to see, you know, like Luminions don't work. We see, we see Luminions from time to time and like uh, Gardevoir and sometimes Lost Box, not really, but uh, Charizards and stuff like that. So to help set up. So it was just a it, that in my mind was like the biggest thing, and then also in there is the Blood Moon Ursaluna EX, Sean. Blood Moon Ursaluna, a card that people really, really liked going into this format and can fit in so many decks. 260 HP normal type basic Pokemon with the ability Season Skilled. Blood, or I'm sorry. Blood Moon used by this Pokemon, which is the attack name on it, costs colorless less for each prize card your opponent has taken. Basically the Radiant Charizard ability, but it does 240 damage. And if if your opponent's taken five prizes, you can attack completely for free. So especially with a primarily single prize deck, Lost Box just really excels and then can just slam you real hard after setting up some damage with like Sableye or Cramoran or something like that. Yeah, it's, it's a just, crazy deck. I, I think it's so cool. No, it's just a great finisher, right? Against especially two prize decks as well in the late game. Like mm-hmm. if you're playing against, you know, I mean, an Iron Hands, like if you're playing against some ride on with an Iron Hands and you just you got to get it out of there. You can even earlier in the game, because you have access to things like uh, Mirage Gate, 
you don't have to play it for colorless, for like no energy. You can throw a couple of energy on after an Iron Hands takes a knockout and say, we, we need to deal with this now, and this is your way to deal with it. Because really, the deck does not have another way to deal with an Iron Hands. It just doesn't. I, I love that you brought up that point, because especially like, again, talking about the top decks in the meta, Lugia plays Iron Hands right now that they have that prism rainbow type yep. energy in there whatever the ace fact is i can't energy. remember what it's called legacy energy yes yeah. prism energy is a different energy from a long time ago boomer over here um legacy energy and then like maridon as well because you know where lugia goes maridon also goes yep. in a sense a lot of times so yeah really really good point as well on that counterpart i will also say that the inclusion of iron bundle in the list um mm -hmm. I, I have become a, a lover of Iron Bundle as well. Playing a deck that doesn't always hit crazy high numbers. Uh, I played a lot of Diplin. And um, Iron Bundle is just such a useful card in certain decks where you're just like, I need... A, you, maybe you don't need the thing in the... Maybe the thing in the active is annoying, so maybe it's a, a cleft key, right? <laughs> you know, if you're mm -hmm. playing Lost Fox, I would rather you not have that in the active. But... Outside of that, too, just from an attacking perspective, you're like, hey, put something else up. I can't deal with your Charizard right now. We'll figure that out later. But first, bring one of those, you know, Charmanders up or bring, you know, something else up that's annoying. And I'm going to hit into that for a second. There's also, you know, the good point that you brought up about, you know, something annoying in the active. If we want to move into the second place list, Stefan yeah. Ivanov hunting for a third international championship win in north america which is insane to think about because now after this weekend the u.s has only won two naic's <laughs> tied with stefan <laughs> ivanov in that aspect uh yep. uh gardevoir a lot of gardevoirs were playing flutter mains yep. in this and so flutter main is a prime example about how iron bundle really excelled for a lot of these decks, because I think we even saw it in one of the stream games of a uh, Gardevoir versus Lost Box, where like the Flutter main just completely shut down, you know, the opposing Lost Box deck because they didn't have any way to get the Flutter main out of the active. So, yeah. um, it's a really good point in that. And uh, as we go into Stefan's list, yeah, yeah, I mean, so Stefan's list here. Um very similar to, similar to some of the Japanese lists because you're running that typical Gardevoir line 442. Your main attackers haven't really changed, generally speaking. You have the Drifloon, you have Screamtail, you have Cresselia, but there's a few support Pokemon that have made their way into this list. Um, I'll start with Monkey Dory. So Monkey, Monkey Dory. Dory. Oh yeah, this honestly, Monkey Dory is the ultimate enabler for the list right now which is, it has an ability, it says once during your turn, if the Monkey Dory has a darkness energy attached to, to, to it, you can move up to three damage counters from one of your Pokemon to one of your opponent's Pokemon. And the perfect thing about this deck is, you know, you want to put, da you're putting damage counters on when you attach the energy, and then you can just be like, yeah, but you take that damage. So it's almost, it's like, it's not almost, it's exactly like adding 30 damage to your attack but you can also do some weird setup damage, which we saw in the finals with Fluttermane. So mm -hmm. Fluttermane, you know, as you were saying, really annoying Pokemon in the active, especially against things like Lost Box, shutting down your opponent's active Pokemon's ability. But Fluttermane also has an attack that's useful. It does 90 damage, and then you can put two damage counters on your opponent's benched Pokemon in any way you like. So you could even get sneaky with the math if you are flutter maining, putting some damage counters, you do that for a turn or two, and then you all also are monkey dory, and you know putting some damage back onto things as well. You can set up a turn where you knock out two Pokemon in one turn rather than just the one. So it's it's crazy the flexibility of this deck and how monkey dory like really enables it overall you know with the you know you may think like only playing a couple dark energies that's not really like too crazy at all but with cards like earth and vessel right that are easily found through things like arvin right and just the draw engine that is curlia yeah. right like refinement curlia you get to see so many cards in the game and you get to do so much and like really a consistent game plan overall it feels like and um 
it's kind of crazy because like I had mentioned at the very end of the podcast, I listened to this back um, just to double check what our picks were <laughs> like uh-huh. heading into the final. Um, and I mentioned how I really, really liked Gardevoir because you could do monkey dory things now. I think that's like quote unquote or verbatim quote. You can do yeah. monkey dory things. So it's kind of incredible how we like knew how strong Guardy was, but we also really undersold Guardy on the podcast, yeah. I feel like. I think it's one of those where, like, I knew how we. I think we knew we saw it in Japan, right? We saw that Guardy, yeah. but it was one of those decks that, like, it should be really good, and but it is a. I will say it's a very complicated deck. It's like um, Lost Box. Yeah, it's extremely complicated, but it's like Lost Box in its sequencing. But I would almost say it sometimes can be more complicated than Lost Box because you're kind of trying to do multiple things at the same time. You're trying Mm -hmm. to juggle where do you place the damage counters? How do you control your opponent maybe with some of this ability lock? And then also, how are you managing your own energy resources? Which, can I just point out, Stefan's list, only running seven psychic energy. That is a mad... You're a madman. Um, (laughs) It's just crazy. Gotta fit in those cards, man. Uh, But last thing I'll say about... Two more things, actually, briefly. Um, He also is running Hyper Aroma. So... Mm -hmm. As the A spec of choice, there's been some like, do you run Max Belt? Do you run the Hero's Cape? You know, whatever, right? And then just choosing the consistency that is Hyper Aroma to get out all of your Curlias as quickly as possible. You're running a heavy Arvin list. So really, but you know, early in the game, all you need is an Arvin turn one going second, an Arvin turn two, and you've got everything you need online, right? Um, and then the last card, they also have a Klefki in the list. Mm-hmm. Um, so the combo of Fluttermane, Klefki means that it's essentially, if you really hate the Fluttermane and you try to get around it without having a boss or a counter catcher, you might just be left with a Klefki in the active. Um, one thing that I will point out uh, is that Klefki does a very strange effect to Manaphy. So mm-hmm. if you are playing this and you're worried that your opponent is going to be Radiant Greninjing, uh, do not put Klefki down. Because if they boss Klefki up, it turns Manaphy's ability off. And now Radiant Greninja is online. So Let me guess. Let me guess. You playing this weekend had a uh-huh. Klefki and a Manaphy on the field, <laughs> and you brought up the Klefki oh, and got I, Greninja. I didn't. Stefan Ivanov did. Oh, that is it, how the it, finals it. match I ended. I actually haven't watched the finals yet. I've been so busy, but I've watched every other round in the tournament. Well, I will say the finals, I'm just going to say, great match. Um, mm-hmm. Both players had to play out of some pretty wild scenarios. At one point, Stefan prized three of his seven psychic energy. At another point, um, Stefan was up uh, uh, two prizes left to Hedrick's six, and, and Hedrick was able to come back and win that game. Gosh. Really good, really good set of three games there. Um, and it just basically, you know, the ending was maybe less exciting, but it was still good. But definitely recommend. Good watch. Not always, finals are not always that interesting. So, did you see I Caterpie's uh run with his famous 1 1 line of for Ra- Ger- for Rafferig? I think Fer- it's called the evolution now. Oh, did you see that for in his or game in no. one of his games? Playing control, he prized all four of his Arvins. All four. That's like a one in one hundred thousand scenario yeah. kind of game. That's crazy. <laughs> that feels bad for sure. I think um, he still won the game. <laughs> oh my! Oh my! Well, I mean, and like as you can see, I, I pulled up the uh, overall top eight again. It's just mm-hmm. you have Lost Zone at first, Lost Zone in eighth place. And then a sea of guardies from seventh, second to seventh. So yeah, <laughs> that was top eight. I think people when uh, when they saw they showed the bracket at NAIC of what the top eight was going to be. I just kept seeing people being like, "Holy guardy! Like, oh my, what is this bracket?" So it's interesting too when you talk about Gardevoir. Uh, it was really split between Hyper Roma and Unfair Stamp. Um, a lot of people, like I know the Australian team, Natalie Brent. Um, Kaiwin, like all playing the unfair stamp, but then you have Stefan Ivanov, Henry Chow, who I think was 11 and 0 
or something like that. Like he had he had an undefeated record through like nine or ten rounds or something like that with Gardevoir and ended up making top eight overall. Um, and so like really just cool to see like kind of the diversity as well of Gardevoir. Like I'd highly encourage you to go to Pokey Stats' website uh, where or PT, PTCG Stats dot com on their website to look at the results because they've got a lot of the deck list posted there of like twitter links and stuff yeah just to see like kind of the variety of guard of war now they're all pretty much the same you know skeleton you know yeah. 56 cards 57 56 cards um but the different choices in like the text and stuff like that are like really interesting overall of like playing multiple TM evolutions, playing Hyper Rona versus Unfair Stamp, like Stefan playing seven energies, yeah. you know, psychic, psychic energies. Um, and so, like, yeah, I don't know. It's, if you love Gardevoir, and it's really, it's actually decently cheap to get because it came in that League Battle deck, um, which you could probably still get for a pretty good price. Um, this is a good deck to build, and it's also a good deck to learn proper like sequencing and resource managing. Yeah, it's a great deck for that. I mean, and I will say too, Hyper Aroma, the price might be spiking a little bit right now, but oh yeah, uh, I don't know for sure. But I mean, look, it might mean it's a good time to pick up Unfair Stamp because I think that card is really, really good too. So I bought it after watching day one. Yeah, Hyper Aroma? Yeah, no, 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 Unfair Stamp. Unfair Stamp I bought yeah. it after, I bought it after watching the day one matches. Yep. So, yeah, I mean, it was, uh, it was cool stuff. Uh, I mean, are there any other, we, we didn't share any list beforehand. Are there any other lists though that I should be, I should be looking at Jake? I don't have them up I on think, limit lists. I think we should at least give a shout out to the highest third archetype, you know, in the rankings at 10th place, Ben Cryer, Snorlax control, I did, you know, give a little bit of credit c to Control. You know, I was on the waiver between Control and Gardevoir of what I would want, you know, uh, to see win. Ben Cryer doing a great job on the uh, on the Control. Looking at this right now, I think Luxurious Cape is pretty cool overall. This Control style, we've seen Control really just shift back and forth on the types that it's going to. This is going back to the Block lax. Snorlax control that 150 HP basic Pokemon from Pokemon Go that doesn't allow your opponents to retreat because newsflash people don't play enough switching cards in format there's no escape rope or anything like that uh prime catcher if you're not running prime catcher a lot of these decks just not playing switch cards um yep or enough switch cards is what I should say so Cool to see this. You know, you see Yakimo in there. Yakimo is something that I really, really liked and hope was uh, hope was much more uh, prevalent in these control decks. But accompanying flute, that's the oh, one yeah. that I want to talk about for these control decks that are being played, especially in this block lax. It is an item card, trainer card, accompanying flute. Reveal the top five cards of your opponent's deck. You may choose any number of basic Pokemon you find there and put those Pokemon onto their bench. Your opponent shuffles all the other cards back into the deck. I love how this card says any amount of fight. If you see five Pokemon in there or all the bench spots are open, you just slap those puppies down oh, right yeah. on the field. And it is terrifying. So really, really cool to see this accompanying flute because a lot of people, especially on these like can't retreat style decks they will try their best especially with no echoing horn in format to not have the pokemon in their hand they're like okay i'm gonna keep them in the deck or i'm gonna keep them in the discard pile and i'm just gonna have one pokemon in the active to just whack you again and again um so accompanying flute is a really really good addition to be able to get around strategies like that and be able to eventually bring different things up so I wanted to give a shout out to this deck because uh, it was one of my picks and uh, Ben Cryer did really well with it. Top 10. Can't complain too much. Yeah. I mean, I will say I talked to some folks about um, control because I, I think we generally think that control has a lot of tools. It probably should be a pretty good deck. Um, so interesting to see somebody got 10th. I think one of the reasons it maybe was played less and maybe saw some less success comparatively is just because of Lugia, right? Lugia plays four jet energies, most likely. 
And that is mm-hmm. going to give you plenty of opportunity to get out of the active, like to switch something out. Um, and if you're playing that with something like, you know, Iron Hands that can, or Chinchilla, whatever, right? You're playing that with some really awkward Pokemon. You can maybe fill up your bench with those two Archeops. Uh, maybe you throw out two Lugias. You can kind of try to fill your bench such that, like, there's not really a lot of good options to, to trap. So that was my only uh, mention there, too, is just, like, Jet Energy is a struggle. Is a struggle. Any time that you have some some sort of like switching card that duels in bonuses, right? Because Jet Energy not only allows the Pokemon to come up to the active, but it also gives an energy, right, to be yeah. able to do an attack and start attacking. Once you start getting those dual combo yeah. uh, bonuses for these like kind of switching effect cards, that is when control like starts to struggle, like you're mentioning with you know, it's matchup against Lugia and such. So, unfortunate, but continuing to play the uh, Misfortune Sisters and Airy. Airy, we've talked about that card a ton. It feels like the last couple podcast episodes, uh, definitely the star of the show when that came out. And, uh, yeah, the uh, Ace spec of choice is Hero's Cape in this one. Not really surprising at all. Yes. I would be curious to see something like Legacy Energy, it's probably bad, but like saying like, okay, this Pokemon that you're going to knock out is worth zero prizes. Um, yeah. I don't know. I mean, it's, it's good, but it only does it for one instance, right? And then you're like, okay. Yeah, but sometimes you feel like, I mean, that, that forces your opponent to basically knock out seven Pokemon effectively. If it you does. don't have, Ro- if you don't get Rotom or Pidgeot caught on the field. Yeah, no, you're absolutely right. Like, that might make the difference. I think the question with Hero's Cape is, if you make it awkward and you trap the wrong things, I think the Hero's Cape works, A, it works well on Snorlax in certain matchups. Mm -hmm. Because if something can't hit above 200, right, then you're just kind of like, well, I hit you. And then your opponent goes, okay, well, I will, you know, do some weird combination, somehow get this Hero's Cape back into my hand. I I don't know. And then, like, play it again. 180 right. the full turn <laughs> right like you're like i can't ever get through this thing so um but outside of that it's also really good in mimic you mm-hmm. because it makes mimic you really hard to kill with an, a non uh rule box pokemon so i i think that's probably why hero's cape is played is because of the versatility but you know to your point like w- play around with it <laughs> So try it out. Let me know yeah. how it goes in the discord in our official Metapod podcast yeah. discord, where you can come and talk about decks, strategies, talk about really anything you want. That's well, you know, appropriate. So. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. I mean, outside of that, I think that's in terms of the actual tournament. Now we have a few months of basically nothing in the way of competitive events. Mm -hmm. Um, June, especially Pokemon has put a moratorium on competitive events for June. We talked about that. Um, I think that does imply that there, that there may be league cups or league challenges returning in July. Um, if that is the start of the next official season. Um, Mm -hmm. so who knows? You might be able to actually take these decks as they are to some sort of competitive tournament, competitive event in, in the next, you know, month or so. But um, outside of that, you know, it's really just the the next big tournament is Worlds, and we're going to have Shrouded Fable for Mm -hmm. that. So who knows how much this is going to change those decks. It'll be interesting, especially when you talk about uh, heading into that. And I especially recommend if you're someone who maybe watched uh, like something like North American Internationals or you know, are wanting to get into the game, like, this is the best time, you know, try to find your local leagues, you know, most places will meet up once a week, it might not be a cup or challenge or anything like super serious, but a weekly meetup usually happens. And so this is a really, really good time, in my opinion, because this is where a lot of people, you know, if you don't have your world's invite, you can't get your world's invite. So a lot of people are taking this time to relax, you know, take the game a little bit more fun. Um, it is a really good entry point as well um, to get into places. And then by the time, you know, you get a couple weeks in or something like that, then like you were saying, Sean, you know, cups and challenges will start to pick back up. You know, you can get a little bit more competitive, you know, after you got your toes wet. Um, 
And yeah. overall, it's just like a it's a really good time to start after NAIC, in my opinion. I will also say it's a good month to try out other alternate formats. I know that yes. my my local league is going to be hosting a GLC tournament. Um, so look out for that maybe as a stream. I don't know. We'll see. I might do that as a stream. Um, let us know in the comments if you want to see a GLC stream. Uh, mm-hmm. I, I'll i be as confused as to what half the cards do as everyone in the audience. So uh, but You just got to yeah. think. If you think of the best cards since black and white that's a majority of the cards right especially the trainers the pokemon yeah. you're gonna have to probably try to familiar, familiar <laughs> yeah there's a lot with. of weird stuff yeah there's a there's a couple weird pokemon especially for some of the types and fairy pokemon i mean we've but we've barely seen fairy pokemon it's been in, it's been 20 years since we've seen fairy pokemon it feels like yeah uh, one other format i'm gonna shout out because i mm-hmm. when i was at naic i was uh you know, I, I did get the chance to meet and spend a decent amount of time, actually, with um, the the folks who run Justin Basil. Uh, and I realized, Jake, it is a uh, that that name, the website name is based off of the phrase just in time. You know, the, the, the phrase like, oh, it's just in time, you know? Yeah. But time and basil being two different like herbs. So it's just in time. Oh, but like switch that to like the other kind of time. And then you have basil just in basil. That's what that's from. That's the deep knowledge. <laughs> Anyways, the person who runs that and then also the person who runs Poco Beach, Water Pokemon mm-hmm. Master. So uh, threw up a, a photo on uh, our Instagram. Uh, but they were awesome. Uh, and uh, Justin Basil was also running a an Eternal format tournament, which... I'd really, I personally, I'd never really heard of Eternal. I'd never look, looked into it all that much. Um, but if you think about Unlimited, so technically Unlimited is a format that Pokemon supports. I don't know. Once supported. They once <laughs> yeah. supported it in PTCGO. Yeah. Um, but if you think about that, where you can play cards theoretically from base set to modern day, Watsy era, you can play those cards. But just... You know, Justin Basil has done a really good job, uh, I think, I don't know for sure, but I assume of banning the cards that that completely break a format because that's sometimes you get further back and you're like, yeah, this card, if it exists in this format, every deck is this and then it's not fun to play. AKA Expanded. (laughs) Yeah, which is what Expanded is right now. So I did get to play in an Eternal format tournament uh, on two different days. I played the same deck. I played a Baby Blounds deck, Jake. I was trans- oh yeah! <laughs> it was so amazing. I was transported back to 2019. It was amazing. Um, I I went. I think like th- like wait wait. What? I went like four and three overall between all both turns. Okay, which is Positive. pretty good. Yeah, yeah. And um, but it was just cool seeing like some really old cards that you're like that aren't even like in expanded, right? They're older than that. And you're just like, this card is insane. Who, like, a level ballable Luminion, Jake. Just think about that. Oh, I level ball for Luminion, and it's a single prizer. Boom, let's go. Okay. And I can play four of the cards in all these decks? Wow. It really reminds me of when I went to NAIC last year. And when I went to NAIC, I played in the uh, Riley Wren's uh, 2010 Worlds Tournament. Um, now, here's the thing. I went into that tournament. I knew nothing about the format. I knew nothing about any of the cards because it's heart, gold, and soul, silver <laughs> cards, yeah. I believe. Like diamond, pearl, and I think a little bit of heart, gold, soul, silver in there. My friend Edge... A uh, good friend of mine, he lent me a deck like five minutes before the tournament. I played Gyarados for anyone who doesn't know that deck. And uh, he was like, okay, this is your strategy. Go get him, Tiger. Um, made top <laughs> eight going 3-1-1 one, one, um, oh in that. Club. But like, it's crazy because there's a really, really popular card that is a four of in every deck in that format. It is Sableye. Sableye from Stormfront, if you do not know that card. Sean, do you know what... No. Do you know, like, say, okay, this is going to blow your mind. I can't wait to hear your reaction on this. Okay. It has an ability called... Or, I'm sorry, not an ability, because at the time they were called Pokey Bodies. Yep. It has a Pokey Body called Overeager. 
If Sableye is your active Pokemon at the beginning of the game, you go first. <laughs> so whether or not you win the coin flip, if you start Sableye, you go first. All right. Um, but if, I like if that. Both, if, if both players have a Sableye in the active at the start of the game, which happens more often than you think in that format, um, you just revert back to the coin flip because okay. it's a never ending loop. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure um, they would have had to figure that out at the time they printed Sableye because it's like, well, what if? And then do, that's not all that this card is broken for. In this format, I think you can attack going first. Mm. So it has this attack that is for free, does not cost energy, called Impersonate. Search your deck for a supporter card and discard it. Shuffle your deck afterwards. Then use the effect of that card as the effect of this attack. So oh, you can technically play two supporters in a turn. Yeah. I mean, that's... Oh, gross. That's so gross. Do you also <laughs> know about, like, one of the best Smeargle cards ever? In Heartgold Soul there's... Silver? No, but there's just too many cards, Jake. I mean... I'm going to tell you about this one, though, because okay. this is also okay. one of my favorite for cards. It. Uh, it's a Smeargle from Undaunted. Has a pokey power... Which is different than an ability and different than a pokey body. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> but it's it's like almost the same thing. Once during your turn before your attack, if Smeagol Sme Smeagol. Smeargle is in is your active Pokemon, you may look at the opponent's hand. If you do, choose a supporter card you find there and use that effect of that card as the effect of this power. So you can use a pokey power to play a supporter, but it's not you playing a supporter. Exactly. So, uh, like, if you know, if I start out and you have Professor's Research in your hand or Professor Oak's new theory, sure, whatever, yeah, in that format, yeah, 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 I can just be like, okay, discard, draw seven. I draw seven cards. I find a Professor Oak's new theory. I'm like, oh, let me use my supporter for turn and discard, draw seven. You know, Jake, I think that that uh, Pokey Power, Pokey Body. Uh, I actually think that they should reprint that as an ability. I really do. I can't wait to see the and reactions online if people print if I, if they no, print either of those either of those cards would be yeah. so hated. In I just everything. I think that you could print it as a you can only use this once during your turn this ability once during your turn, I, and maybe you can only use it on your first turn going first right like if you did like a little combination I, yeah but like I would agree with that because most people's problem with a lot of these for a lot of these like. Uh, I guess since like the first turn supporter rule changed yeah. in the Pokemon training card game, a lot of people feel like there is a heavy advantage to going second at mm. sometimes or like, you know, it, it comes or not even necessarily that, but like if you go first and you just don't have a slightly yep. less than ideal start, if you have an awful, awful, awful start, you've already lost the game. A lot of people feel like. Yeah, I, I think that setup decks especially, I think it's good that Pokemon has moved into more setup decks. Like, we see Gardevoir being a top-tier mm -hmm. deck. We see Lugia. We see um, Dragapult. All these decks that are, like, stage ones or sometimes stage twos, where it's like, I think that's the right direction for Pokemon to go. Um, but you're right. the Those decks want to go first because they need to set up. But if you just have a hand that's got, like, you know a couple of your evolutions and it doesn't have any Pokemon. Or it's got like one nest ball. And you're yeah, like, like, it can even be down to like, you have like, uh, you're playing Charizard, right? And you're going first. You have Arvin in hand. You have Rare Candy in hand. You have Forest Seal Stone in hand, right? Like you have an Energy in hand. Yeah. You have good cards in hand. You just can't play that Arvin to make it a good start. Yeah. Um, so that's that's like a lot of people's problem is scenarios like that coming up. So I, I do think that if they I, – I wish they would reprint something like Smeargle but inherently nerfed to only happen on the very first yeah. turn of the game. Um, but who knows if we'd see that be played. I know in like – what was it? 2016 or something, the Greninja Break decks would play uh, Talonflame. Okay. That was like, if you have this Pokemon in your starting hand, you could make that your active Pokemon at the start of the game. Oh, okay. I mean, yeah. it's interesting. I, 
The reason I think that is, uh, you know, you remember the card that we did the challenge on a few years ago? That was a that's, Sabrina's suggestion. Sabrina's suggestion, yes. <laughs> The reason that card is basically unplayable is it's because, like, why do I want to play my opponent's supporter? Why don't I just put it in the supporters that I want, right? Like, it's because it's I like weird... to have fun in the Pokemon trading card game, right. Sean. But, like, I think I do think that that is a fun thing. And if you printed a Pokemon that was basically like, hey, we like having fun here, we like a little chaos, right? Mm -hmm. Go for it, try it. And I'm like, yes, I want more of that. So. It's really cool to see uh, Pokemon right now, and I'm very curious uh, to see locally how things evolve because we won't have another major tournament in this format. Um, so no, uh, who knows if Gardevoir would continue to stay the top deck, and who knows <laughs> with uh, the next set if Gardevoir will continue. We know that the next set coming up, which we'll do a set review, you know, well before Worlds, you know, when that happens, but. Um, there's a lot of dark Pokemon in there yes. and there's a lot of the, I mean, there's just like a lot of dark Pokemon. So like, yeah. who knows if that can dethrone Gardevoir, uh, at the world championships this upcoming year. That's very, very true. Um, but yeah, I think that's going to do it for, for this week. Hopefully, uh, everybody else, you know, who went to NAIC had a good time and, uh, maybe we'll see you. Uh, I'm not, I'm not saying for Jake, maybe, uh, maybe we'll see you at uh, in New Orleans next year. Maybe. Oh, I also I'm, like the joke that Jake and I still have never met each other. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a good we one. reminded everybody in the Discord that this weekend. Yeah, it, yep. we've never been in the same room, so <laughs> think that of what you will. You know. Yeah. All right. Anyways, thank you so much for listening to the Meta Pop Podcast, Pokemon podcast that revolves around the evolving meta. We'll talk a little bit next week about the world structure, just to give you a little bit of preview. We're a little bit out of time today because we're busy, but we'll be looking forward to that and more news hopefully next week. I'm Jake Fat Sean, and uh, we'll see you later. Bye.